Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andreas Feldman. I'm associate professor at the Latin American Latino Studies Program in the Department of Political Science. I'm also uh, the PI of the uh, Global Migration Cluster. And I have the honor of introducing our, our keynote, keynote speaker, uh, Valeria Luiselli. Before I do that, I would like to start by thanking the, the organizers, uh, the LAS team, uh, the dean, and Vicky and, and her team, also my colleagues in, in the organizing committee. And I would like to start by taking the liberty of saying that in a, in a more sort of personal sense, this is a very satisfying and rewarding uh, occasion uh, because in a way it shows the fruits uh, of the cluster initiative. And I, I, I see many colleagues here who have been working on this and it has been a long, at times a bit tortuous process. Uh, Jenny's laughing. Uh, but I think the ones who actually had the idea in mind had precisely this sort of end product probably, you know, this idea of having a, a group of scholars. I mean, UIC was, before many of us came here, uh, a site of, of really excellent work in migration, broadly conceived. But the idea was to, in a way, fulfill two objectives. On the one, on the one hand, diversify the faculty, and on the other, try to sort of harness the potential that UIC had. And just by seeing many of the ones who were hired, um, young, talented, committed, uh, just the level of this, this conference in a way shows that. And I think it, it reveals the incredible potential that there is here, and a potential that I hope we can harness in, in the future. But I, I must say it gives me a lot of satisfaction. So before becoming too emotional about this, I'll, I'll, I'll start by uh, thanking and, and, and well doing what I'm supposed to do, which is introducing Valeria. So I'm honored to introduce Valeria Luiselli as a keynote speaker this afternoon. Uh, professor Luiselli is a Sadie Samuelson Levy Professor in Languages and Literature at Bard College and a visiting professor at Harvard University. She was born in Mexico City and grew up in South Korea, South Africa, and India. An acclaimed writer of both fiction and nonfiction, she's the author of several novels, essays, and short stories, including Sidewalks, Faces in the Crowd, The Story of My Teeth, uh, Tell Me How It Ends, an essay of 40 questions, and Lost Children Archive. Her work has also appeared in, in several uh, outlets, uh, media outlets, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, Granada, and McSweeney. Um, She's the recipient of, and bear with me, because she's, recipient, she's the recipient of several awards, um, very prestigious ones, including the Dublin Literary Award, two Los Angeles Times Book Prizes, the Carnegie Medal, and the America Book Award. She has also been nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Kirkus Prize, and the Booker Prize. In addition, she was the recipient of the 2019 MacArthur Fellowship, a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree, and Bearing Witness Fellowship from the, Arts, from the Art for Justice Fund. Beyond her artistic creation and scholarly work, Professor Liselli is involved in various activities to promote social justice and give voice to migrants, refugees, people deprived of, from their freedom, as well as victims of gender violence. There are many examples of this, and this reflects, I think, in, in her wonderful work. Um, following her work as a translator for detained migrants, she started a literature, literacy program for girls in a detention center in upstate New York that focuses on creative writing. Professor Licelli holds a BA from the uh, famous UNAM in Mexico and a PhD in comparative literature from, the university, from Columbia University in New York. So without further delay, and let's warmly welcome Professor Liselli with a round of applause. And just one last thing. So Professor Liselli will you know, read parts of uh, her, her new work, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of, of her readings. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Hi, thank you very much, everyone. Is the sound OK? Yeah? So yeah, this is it's not like my new work. This is a, a new essay, <laughs> just something I'm working on. And 
I haven't really written anything about um, uh, the period in which I worked uh, uh, giving a, a workshop in a detention center. Um, it's been more than four years since, since then. And I, the last um, nonfiction piece that I wrote uh, really about um, un undocumented children in the immigration system was a long time ago. So somehow pa time has passed quickly and that book was called Tell Me How It Ends. And it's a book that doesn't speak about something that came later. Um, it, that's not quite accurate. It was already happening then, but it became more and more the practice, which was that a lot of children uh, that passed th through the immig immigration system and used to pass only very briefly through detention spaces called shelters, but detention spaces, in the period in which I was working in those spaces, they would be detained for much, much longer. But I speak about this a little bit here. Uh, so I don't, I don't write about that and tell me how it ends because it didn't seem to me then, um, it, I was really not aware that that was what was coming, but that's what was brewing. So uh, I've written a text. Um, I haven't yet read this out loud, so uh, let's see how it goes. Um, and here it is. It's for now called Sometimes, Still, and Across. A few years ago, following a period in which I had served as a volunteer interpreter for undocumented children in deportation proceedings, I decided, I decided to start a small writing workshop in a detention center near New York City. The students were a group of girls between the ages 12 and 16. Most of them had crossed the US-Mexico border without a visa and had been detained by Border Patrol and had then been locked up in this dark place, a place similar to so many others of its kind, a type of place which the government cynically calls shelter but which is unquestionably a, a carceral space for children. In the last session of our workshop, I asked the girls to write five sentences beginning with a veces, which means sometimes. I thought that a sometimes could be a way to make space for the little things that happen, either flickering instants of the psyche or of mundane everyday events, and that passes by almost always unnoticed or ignored. Sometimes I brush my teeth without toothpaste. Sometimes my friend farts in class. Sometimes I'm afraid of adults when they laugh. Sometimes I don't have enough strength. I understand writing in this way, like the space that opens with sometimes. Or rather, I am interested in the kind of fiction that is coded in sometimes. Fiction that hinges on surprising readers, on constantly keeping them on edge, is written in a kind of suddenly. The writing that comes from again was perhaps born with, but also self-exhausted with Beckett, because it was paradoxically, paradoxically irrepeatable. No longer has Gregor Samsa stuck to a bed, lost in the intricate pathways of guilt, and it has the band of children and Lord of the Flies leaving behind whatever humane attributes they once had and giving themselves over fully to being indisputable motherfuckers. Once upon, fiction is sweetly tucked away in the mausoleum of fairy tale and fable. Fiction written in never is by definition impossible. And I'm not sure what to make of fiction in still, but I may come back to that later. And I don't come back to it later, not in this version yet. <laughs> I, but in another version, I will. <clears throat> in the specific case of this particular workshop, a workshop taking place in a situation of physical confinement and psychological terror, where the students were not only living in detention, but were also being subject to a removal proceeding, this sometimes was maybe an opportunity, I thought, small but real, for the opening of a parenthesis. A parenthesis that is, that made space for a narrative outside the repetitive, beyond the determined, beside what is mandated by the implacable clockwork of routine behind closed doors. A parenthesis for a time outside time and outside of doing time, a door that opens sometimes. 
We all took our seats around the dining table, and my niece, who was helping me give the workshop, distributed blank journals and pencils. Some girls were happy with the design of their journal cover, some were not, some traded. As we began to introduce ourselves, some girls looked at us expect in expectant silence, others with a little interest, others with less, justifiably skeptical. One girl whispered something in another's ear. A staff member from the center reprimanded her, respeto. We were two years into the Trump administration, and the panorama for undocumented minors had changed significantly. The turn things took, like most things in those years, were for the worse or the much worse. The agency in charge for centers of, for unaccompanied minors is not ICE, but the ORR. This is thanks to something called the Flores Agreement, which the Supreme Court passed in 1993 and which set up minimal standards in, for living conditions in detention spaces for children, such as being allowed to sleep on a bed or having access to clean drinking water. The Flores Agreement also ensures, quote, prompt release of children from immigration detention. During the Obama years, children who arrived alone to the US were held in these shelters or centers for a few days or weeks and released as soon as possible to a family member. But after family separation policies took hold in the Trump years and during the rampant increase of ICE raids that resulted in the mass displacement of people from their communities into detention centers, Uniting or reuniting a child with their adult family member became much more difficult, sometimes impossible. Children and teenagers were being held, therefore, in these spaces for many months, and in some cases, years. A few of the girls in the workshop had been transferred several times from state to state, place to place, without ever knowing when their forced peregrinations through the detention system would ever end. From the kitchen adjacent to the dining space, a potent smell of lentils blew in intermittently toward us. Sometimes when I smell boiling lentils, I remember a story my daughter's paternal grandmother often tells about when she was a little girl and they fled Spain, the Spain of Franco, and were thrown into the concentration camp in Argel-sur-Mer, just across the northern border. Sometimes, when there were not enough lentils for everyone to eat, the woman in the camps would boil shirt sleeves and bits of trousers. Children ate that cloth and lentil soup and asked no questions. I wondered what the girls in the workshop were being fed and if they asked questions. A layout. First, our small writing circle sitting around the table. Then, in its immediate periphery, three staff members sitting on chairs pushed up against the wall. They were there to oversee the workshop. Then, beyond and above the caretakers, hanging at an angle from the corners of the room, cameras that surveyed us all. I'm not sure who surveilled the eyes behind the screen, behind the camera, but I imagine that these concentric circles of surveillance had to end somewhere, maybe in Pennsylvania or Kentucky. We had clear instructions. Not a single piece of writing was to leave the center. Only things the only things allowed in were writing materials and books. We were not allowed to talk about the girls' cases in the workshop, meaning we could not suggest writing exercises that would lead them to write about the reasons why they migrated or about their migration journey. The reason for this was simple. Anything that they wrote down would constitute evidence, a document potentially used against them in the deportation preceding trial, even if it were fictional. A lawyer and friend also advised us not to suggest exercises that would incite the girls to talk or write about their circumstances in confinement. There was no written prohibition on this, but it was quite clear in every stage of our work there, from the moment I pitched the workshop to the period in which we awaited approval while we were cleared by ICE and later by the center's administration, to the small interactions with staff in the center itself, that there is a certain nervousness in allowing a stranger in who might later leak information out. 
there is a secretiveness in the way detention spaces are operated that exceeds, and this is from talking to friends that do a lot of work in prisons and sort of comparing stories, but there is a, there is a, there is a kind of um, operation that exceeds uh, the secretiveness even of that of normal prisons, normal quote unquote normal prisons. When we were in the early stages of planning the workshop, conscious of the restrictions we had, but still largely unaware of the kind of surveillance there would be, I tried to imagine ways for the workshop to allow a space for the girls to denounce the conditions they were under without getting into trouble by doing so. I came up with a plan, a plan that ultimately failed, but it failed well, and it's a failure worth recounting because failures are often a lot more telling than stories that simply go well and end well. This was the plan. We could read the Quixote together, which Cervantes actually had written in a prison. It was a light-hearted, but also deep and wildly imaginative book, and its chapters were almost always short, so we could read them out loud at the beginning of each session, and then still have time to devote the second part of the session to writing. After some sessions, we'd come up with a system of equivalences and correspondences between the world of the Quixote and the reality in which the girls were living. For example, the famous windmills would be equivalent to ICE officers, and the band of Galicians in chapter 10 would be equivalent to the staff in the detention center. We would slowly, together, refine this system of equivalences by means of drawing analogies during informal, during informal conversation, and then eventually each girl would have a kind of cheat sheet connecting the two worlds. That's where we could start playing. I'd give them prompts for short fictional scenes written in Quixote code. All of them would be quotidian scenes, humorous, nothing incriminating for the detention center itself. However, by now, the girls would have a code, and if they ever needed to use it, they could, amongst themselves or with us, if we gained their trust enough. The important thing, or so I thought, was to give them the instruments for whenever they might need them. After all, that's what writing is for. In any case, I wrote to a publisher, and they generously donated 20 Quixotes, and we arrived in the center on our first day with boxes full of paperbacks, good intentions, and a good deal of ignorance. The plan, as I've already said, failed. It failed, first of all, for the most obvious reason, which was that the amount of surveillance, or the type of surveillance, simply made the whole plan too risky for the girls. Even if we tried to dress the whole experiment in humor and Quixote-like Quixote delirious imagination, discussing why ice might be like windmills and if the staff in the center might correspond better to the donkey in the donkey scene or the Galicians who beat the shit out of Don Quixote and Sancho, excuse my archaic Spanish, was simply too dangerous. The worst thing that could happen to us would be to get kicked out. But the consequences for them, for the students, were of course much more serious, very real, and even life-changing. There were always staff members present, listening to our every word, and then there were the cameras, and who knows where those led. Second, the plan failed for a reason I should have foreseen but didn't. Almost all the girls, except the few of those that had grown up in capital cities, spoke Spanish as their second language. They were speakers of Mayan languages, among them Achi, Chu, Itza, Quiche, Man, Mopan, Quechi. They all spoke Spanish, as that's the language imposed by the Latin American governments in schools, even in indigenous communities. But reading the Quixote is not easy, not an easy task for any young reader, with its archaic lexicon and peninsular conjugations no longer in use in Latin America. We read some paragraphs out loud together, and I immediately sensed a deflation of what enthusiasm there might have been in the room. I also suppose that a story about an old man from La Mancha was not immediately appealing for teenage girls. <laughs> Last, the plan failed for a great reason. And the reason was that the girls already had a written code language. And as soon as we had passed around the journals, pieces of paper were being ripped out and notes were being passed around. We only realized this at the end of the first session when we were picking up and packing up and saw a mysterious looking note, half in Spanish, and asked one of the girls what kind of code it was written in. She smiled, a little mischievous, big, smart black eyes, 
and said nothing. Immigration cases are not criminal cases. Migrating without documents is not a crime, as some people believe it to be. It's considered an administrative fault. And therefore, it is the immigration court and not the criminal court that processes immigration cases. Following this logic, one would think that the ultimate punishment for migrating would not be prison, since there was no crime in the first place. But in reality, this plays out quite differently. Since the creation of, department of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002, so it's not that old, not that necessary, since the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002, migrants have been increasingly criminalized. They're detained, in legal jargon, under the suspicion of being deportable, which is as ridiculous as anyone saying that someone is punished under the suspicion of being punishable. Under such suspicion, tens of thousands of people a year are incarcerated until proven not guilty. That is, until the judge has reviewed their case and determined whether the person is eligible for asylum or other forms of immigration relief, or if, on the contrary, the person is not eligible and will be deported. That decision can take months or years, and in the meantime, the person remains locked up. And unlike most citizen prisoners, 90% of whom are in publicly run prisons, the vast majority of undocumented migrants are sent directly to privately run prisons or detention centers. In fact, as of 2022, 79% of the undocumented population who is incarcerated is in a private facility. All of this means that while a person remains in detention for waiting for a decision on their non-criminal case, there is a company that is making money. Geo Group, for example, one of the largest companies in the prison industrial complex, has a net worth of $1.2 billion right now and grew 40% in 2023. They receive tens of millions each year from congressional appropriations, therefore your taxes, my taxes, and in return fund individual campaigns very generously. Marco Rubio, for example, received 60K from them in 2022. By the way, this give and return process, even in Mexico, is called corruption. The case for minors is different, but not so different. The centers where accompanied, unaccompanied minors are kept while they wait for their cases to go to trial or while they're able to reunite with a family member are owned by nonprofit organizations that have contracts with the government. I asked a lawyer about this, whether the nonprofit organizations that operate so-called shelters for children are indeed fully nonprofit. She chuckled. There's no real way to know, she told me. How can I find out? I asked her. You can file a FOIA, but even so, that might not give you a straight answer. As the weeks went by in our workshop, we tried out writing prompts, games, narrative strategies. I like a prompt inspired by the Olipo, which involves asking students to write one, a one-paragraph bio, and then once they've written it, to write it again, this time with a constraint. The constraint is they cannot use the letter E at all. The results are marvelous, because the second version is usually much better, full of unexpected solutions, even humor. Someone who writes, I am a student, the first time around, may write, I am a human child who is at school, the second time. The discussion around that particular exercise is always illuminating, because students tend to quickly realize how a constraint, or what was perceived as an obstacle, is in fact the reason why their writing suddenly picked up. Circumnavigation leads to discovery. But we still had a problem. We still had an enormous obstacle, and we hadn't found an imaginative way around it. A couple of girls had gotten into trouble with the staff of the detention center for something they had written in their journals. The staff wouldn't tell us what it was and why they were in trouble, but their journals had been confiscated, and that day they had to borrow pieces of paper. We were annoyed, of course, at the staff, why would they be reading the journals in the first place? But of course, there's no privacy in detention, and we should have known that, and we should have protected the girls from something like this. On our ride back home from the center that day, my niece had a brilliant idea. What if we collectivized the writing so that the girls didn't have individual journals at all, but all wrote together in one kind of enormous journal? 
individual sheets of paper were fine, but we also wanted to be able to collect the work for the girls to see and have and read. We didn't want to produce material that was immediately going to be discarded, sheets of paper that would end up in the trash the day later. We'd made a fanzine. We'd make a fanzine. What's more, each girl would also choose a pen name and would use it if and when they wanted. So we arrived at next week's session full of new enthusiasm. My niece led the session, explained what a fanzine was and how we would be writing collectively. She told them she would use the pen name Masorca, which means corn cob, but also a group of friends. And now everyone would choose their own name, following the only rule that the name be either an animal, a plant, or something existing in nature. The girls thought about it, brainstormed, and wrote down a name for themselves. Then we went round, uttering new names out loud. Huracán, Cascada, Mar, Conejita, Sol, Flor, Terremoto, Luna, Mariposa, Rosa, Estrella, Abejita, Arcoiris, Oscuridad. From that moment on, something changed profoundly in the way we worked together. It was the collective spirit of the fanzine making, sure, but it was something else. And I think that something was the almost magical cloak of visibility, invisibility, afforded by the new names. Suddenly, they were not themselves, but both a character and an author. Conejita, Bunny, wrote things very much akin to the gentle, discreet spirit of a rabbit. Oscuridad, darkness, was full of potent lyricism and wrote of chains and broken wings and feeling locked. Terremoto, earthquake, wrote about intelligence. She ended a beautiful paragraph about the importance of cultivating intelligence with the dictum, no vas a tener miedo, you will not be afraid. The things they wrote in the fanzine were not directly about why or how they had left their homelands, but in a deeper sense, they were. They wrote about the importance of friendship, about sorority and solidarity amongst women, the dangers of hatred and greed, their grave concerns about the environment and how mining companies, mostly from the US and Canada, are destroying their communities. During one session, they wrote feminist manifestos against sexual abuse and defending the sovereignty of their own bodies. Several of them, deeply religious, wrote about their spiritual sentiments and their connection to their God. Others, less so, preferred to write about the importance of making good decisions and remaining centered and courageous in the face of uncertainty. They were very proud, I think, of the fanzine they produced over the months. And in the very end, they wrote a kind of prologue or introduction for it. <clears throat> They decided, in a subtle but at the same time potent turn that I did not expect, to address the prologue and therefore dedicate the entire fanzine to future girls in their same situation. Primeramente, un saludo a ti, compañera, que estás leyendo esto. Nosotras somos chicas que conformamos un grupo creativo. Nosotras creamos esta publicación acerca de nuestros sueños, ideas, pensamientos. Este fanzine lo trabajamos todas las niñas que pasamos por la casa Brooks. Nosotras creemos que es importante ser solidarias, apoyarnos unas a otras. Siéntete orgullosa porque has venido tras tus sueños. Amate y valórate a ti misma. First and foremostly, a salute to you, sister, who are reading this. We are girls who formed a creative group. We created this publication about our dreams, our thoughts, our ideas. This fanzine was created by all of us who passed through the Brooks house. We believe it is important to have solidarity with each other, support one another. Feel proud about yourself because you have come after your dreams. Love and value yourself. The girls had understood in a few months what it has taken me a lifetime devoted to writing to understand, which is that one writes for a community and in order to form a community. Nobody knows their readers, who they will eventually be. But when we write, we somehow know there is someone out there whose mind and ours will meet one day and find a sense of communion, of companionship, of real understanding. This is the most beautiful thing about writing, 
how it can travel in space and reach another mind. Poor Tesla guy, invent, investing billions in science fiction when we have already invented transmigration and time travel. The USA is the country with the largest immigration detention infrastructure in the world, detaining almost half a million migrants each year and maintaining a daily bed quota of 35,000 people. The detention center system will continue to expand until private prisons are fully outlawed. The Biden administration made some small steps in that direction when they ruled out when they ruled that the government's Department of Justice would no longer sign contracts with private prison companies. Unfortunately, the new law does not apply to detention centers because they fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security. When a young person arrives undocumented and alone to the United States and is thrown into the Department of Homeland Security's immigration labyrinth, the narrative of their lives becomes reduced to a few generic statements to a one-way street of identity. You are undocumented. You are a refugee. You are unaccompanied. You are a minor. You are a migrant. You are illegal. Names of things and things themselves begin to disappear. The name of the river that rolled down the mountainside and across your town disappears. No one cares what it was called. The name of the boy next door and the name of the woman who sold candy in the corner shop are gone. The, di the dinner table is slowly erased and so is the back of your grandmother flipping tortillas, humming or muttering or almost always scolding. Gone are the affections, gone the small things that gave you a name. Nobody knows your favorite kind of shoes, your favorite story, the type of pen you prefer, the boy you liked. The process of migrating is often the process of undocumenting. An undocumented person is someone who has been violently stripped off a language, a narrative, a story, unless they defend that story, and most people will. In the last session I gave, I asked the girls for five sentences, starting with a veces. I don't remember any of the sentences with exactness. They were Something like, a veces extraño a mi papá y a mi mamá, a veces no quiero hablar, a veces recuerdo mi pueblo. But there was one that I've never ever forgotten. It was written by Terremoto, Earthquake, in small, neat writing. She read it out loud, soft-spoken but resolute. A veces estoy triste y a través de triste estoy feliz. Sometimes I am sad, and across sad, I am happy. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, thanks so much for your, for your talk. In, in a previous panel, we talked a bit about. I'm holding it. <laughs> That's why I sit in the front row so that I can hear <laughs> whether I use it or not. But <clears throat> is it off? No, it's on, right? I think I think it is on. I just literally was holding it away from my <laughs> face. Um, but in a previous panel, there was some discussion about refugee and asylum, and the genre of narrative that is required to fit into mm -hmm. the established legal categories. Yes. And I just wondered if doing these workshops made you think about that mm. um, and its many contrasts to the, you know, the many other forms of narrative that you were exploring. Yes. Um, well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> it really did, but not only the workshop, but um, previous to the workshop I had uh, worked for uh, a long time in um, translating uh, cases, translating testimonies so that they could be 
become a case that a pro bono lawyer took and then um, hopefully won. And those were cases, uh, testimonies of children who were in deportation proceedings. And the, um, the categories for eligibility there are, are as, as narrow as uh, asylum um, criteria. The, the most kids um, ask either for asylum or something called a SIG uh, protection, uh, special immigrant juvenile status. And, um, and of course, what both, what both uh, paths of immigration relief uh, force is a, is a kind of um, a one, one way or one lane highway of, of a story. Uh, you can, you comply uh, or not, right? And so yes, stories have to of course fit into those very narrow categories. And the idea of writing is always the, to do the opposite, right? To, to kind of, um, uh, to nuance, to multiply, to, to, to create multiplicity and, and, and layered stories of selfhood, of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. I, I'm very, if, if I understood correctly, the story of my teeth is exactly the culmination of a workshop you organized with Humex workers. And so I wonder if your experiences uh, with the hum Humex workers mm -hmm. informed the, your ideas of the planning process that you just described for this mm -hmm. detention center, considering that both workers, um, uh, this factor, well, I imagine that those were factory workers in the story of my teeth. Yeah. And so my question is, what are the uh, similarities and differences that you found in the planning process of those two mm. and the creative process that you uh, were able to get from the Humex workers mm. that culminated in the story of my teeth? To what extent you think, like maybe a few years from now, you will be able to replicate the story or, mm. or use what you learned from the detention center, something similar like that, that it will be very much needed for the current times that we are now, like getting into that type of creative process. And also, um, I was very surprised by your choice of Del Quixote, because maybe you also s suspected that there were gonna be some literacy challenges. So mm -hmm. if you were to like eliminate that blind spot, what other story or like literary artifact would you have chosen mm -hmm. for that particular audience in, in upstate New York? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, after the Quixote failure, uh, I we didn't we didn't bring back any particular uh, book to to follow us. And I was I was hopeful with the Quixote because uh, I had volunteered a few times with a really interesting um, uh, group in uh, in New York in uh, run uh, kind of like a one room schoolhouse that that was run by a guy called Stephen. Um, I'm blanking, but uh, he he had a a group of students from like from five years old to like seventeen. So it was like a really, 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 really uh, wide range age range, and he managed to teach them Paradise Lost, like, like including the kids. He taught them Latin and musical notation, and then. I met them when they were in the process of translating the Quixote from English, no, from Spanish into, um, into English, but in a musical theater version. And not only that, they had, they had swapped the Quixote guy for, like, so he was no longer uh, a man from La Mancha, but a group of immigrant children. So it was like a, col a collectivization of the, the identity of the Quixote. And they were wild. It was these incredibly delirious, I mean, if the Quixote is already delirious, this play was so much more and wonderful. And they would, um, they would uh, showcase their, their advances uh, in people's houses and in small venues. And so they, they came to my house twice in two consecutive years. So I was hopeful that we would establish a connection with them I didn't tell. I don't tell this in the piece, um, 
but there was another fail in the in my process of trying to understand how to teach in this place um, that was um, if we basically I, I wanted to establish a bridge between those kids that were doing the Quixote uh, and the girls in the detention center so we brought in letters the kids wrote letters and we brought them in for the girls to read and the girls were really ex excited to 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 have correspondence as always I mean as, as, as we all used to be before email, right? Um, and however, they then uh, scolded us and said that we were not allowed to bring letters in, which is insane. Uh, that's, again, you know, what I was uh, right, right about in the piece, you know, not, um, e there's even more restrictions than in, in normal prisons, which is something quite difficult to understand. You know? like, uh, even all the good things in term, you know, that, that people have been able to do in prison work, like bring literacy programs and, uh, and correspondences, uh, that all of that is like just n not viable in a detention center or difficult, very difficult to do. So yeah, I think I gave you a kind of long answer. And then the who makes factory thing? Um, yeah, she's referring to a kind of delirious book that I... Uh, <laughs> I read, I read, I wrote, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, some years ago in which um, I didn't know really I was writing a book, but I was uh, very interested in um, understanding the connection between a factory and a gallery owned by that factory. And the factory is the juice monopoly in Mexico, Jugos Mexicanos, Jumex. And... Um, the, the gallery is owned by Humex, and I just thought that it was weird, and the gallery is uh, contemporary art, and um, so I wanted to ask the, the, the workers how they felt about the fact that their work ultimately bought the, these pieces of like desiccated dogs, and I don't know, pictures of, uh, I don't know, contemporary art. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so we established this mechanism by which I would write an installment each week kind of about the art that was in display, but also about other stuff. And they would read those installments out loud, and then they would uh, respond to them. They would criticize them heavily often. It was like a brutal workshop. Um, but I wasn't physically present. I was, in, I was here in the US. And so they would, um, they would record all their sessions, and then I would get the MP3 file, audio file, and listen to them. And then I would write the next installment. So it was like a nine, it was like a 19th century serial novel process, except with MP3 uh, in the middle. <laughs> and so what resulted was this book called "The Story of My Teeth," uh, about an, an auctioneer that auctions teeth, uh, among other things. Um, but the process of listening and sort of that back and forth, indeed, I think, has informed my work thereafter. Um, mm, I don't know, in a very obvious sense, just in, as just m made me a, a, a better listener maybe, but also like the process by which I write from then on is very linked to sound recording, to sound, in fact, right now I'm working on a, a sound piece, a big sound piece, 24 hour sound piece, and you won't have to listen to, <laughs> you can listen to a little part of it, but it's, so yeah, I've been working with sound ever since actually. Hi, my name is Melanie, so actually, yeah, uh, my name is Melanie, so actually before coming here, I was living in New York City, and at my university in New York City, during one of my immigration literature classes, we read um, Tell Me How It Ends, mm. and so we analyzed that, like, the whole semester, we cried, like, all the time, <laughs> and so between having read that and now hearing this piece of work that you've done, I wanted to ask... Obviously, the experiences that undocumented migrants face in these detention centers are just complete, direct examples of oppression, but what role do you think that these literal children, that their youth and them being minors sort of played in their experiences? Mm. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to ask is what role did them being children play 
that makes their experiences a little bit different from the adults and from what you've seen in translating their testimony and doing workshops like these? Damn, it's a really hard question. I don't know what to answer. I think I might need to, as they say in panels, get back to you on that one. <laughs> like when I write a book <laughs> about it maybe in five years, I don't know. Uh, it's a really, really good question. Um, I haven't worked with with adults uh, directly so much. I I tried to write about um, uh, obstetric violence against women in detention, and when I say try to write, it's more like I try to research, but it's a um, dead end street in terms of transparency of information. Um, there's just no way to understand what's going on inside a detention center in, in that sense, unless you, know, unless you speak to people that, that left, right, and, um, and that want to talk about it. But I'm often not interested in, um, in testimonies and reproducing testimonies and then just reproducing violence on the page, but rather in understanding the mechanisms behind, like the systemic uh, mechanisms that allow for that violence to take place in the first place. Um, so, but that's very difficult because, for example, you know, there's medical contractors that work in detention centers, um, and if you go to the pages in detention centers, you, you, you'll see them listed, but then you call the companies, I've called numerous companies to, to ask very basic questions, like how they get contracts, how they choose doctors, who the doctors are, where are they, how, like, just how, just how does it work? You know, not, not, not even incriminating questions, just really how does the system work? And there's just, no one will answer. People will just um, hang up the phone. And so with detention centers for adults, my impression is that uh, find, like, finding a way into clear information is, is impossible. I'm not impossible. I mean, it has to be done, and I think if enough people are chipping away, eventually we will erode <laughs> enough that more will be known, and then more can be done in terms of uh, contesting and pushing and asking for legislation changes. So I do think it's important to do it and to try, right? Um, and with children, the, the centers are, are not these... Pri uh, privately contracted centers, so there's supposedly less, um, less, uh, yeah, less carceral. The place where I ended up teaching was very low security, otherwise it wouldn't have let, let me in. Uh, but, but I know that there's a, there's a spectrum as well within the, within the system for children, uh, and that is something that's very serious too. So anyway, as you can see, I'm not sure, I'm not sure or I don't know is my answer, but I think that you should devote many of years of your life to thinking about it. <laughs> Hi, Valeria. Oh, I'm right here, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for, for sharing that essay with us. I, I think I'm still thinking with or haunted by your prompt of a veces, and it strikes me as something that um, you do a lot in your writing, which is embrace the fragment. Hmm. And I'm wondering about that prompt and the fragment as a way of writing. Um, mm -hmm. To me, it seems like a way of interrupting the kind of authoritative um, language of the state, of like the, the complete or the fixed. And yeah, I'm just wondering if you can speak more about the fragment, the avesis, and like how that mode of writing is a way of interruption. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to, st st starting to try to think about that uh, in this essay, you know, that, well, as I was writing this. Uh, um, and I think the direction of my thought is taking me toward just thinking that, that um, m more than the fragment, the, the kind of uh, temporal spirit of something like a veces, as opposed to suddenly, as opposed to de pronto or siempre, is, is one that, that kind of uh, allows a parenthetical moment, right? And a veces is something that doesn't happen always, right? So it allows us like a moment outside time 
that is a, like an underscoring of a moment outside time, uh, outside the normal cor course of time. So, I mean, in the space, in the carceral space, or in the repetitive space of, of uh, being behind closed uh, doors, closed walls, uh, I thought that an aveses could be a space for, for the moments in which the mind is outside, outside of that, no? the moments that are um, outside doing time, outside time. Um, but I think that that extends to, to, other, to other spaces that are not, not necessarily carceral spaces, right? That, that it's a, m a mode, it's not that the writing has to begin with Avesis, but it's more like the spirit in with which it is written, right? That what do we pay attention to? Thank you so much. That was I felt um, energized um, by your writing. Um, I was just curious about your writing process, and as you mentioned, that this was um, a nonfiction essay, and that you typically do creative writing. So I was wondering if the pro what the process was like. Mm. You know, is the process similar? It sounds like you work a lot like a researcher, like an ethnographer, mm. and I was wondering if that process is the same when you're doing creative writing versus, I mean, they're both creative, but you know what I mean, not these two different, I guess, mm. genres. Yeah, I mean, I first of all think that all writing is creative. Um, it takes, you know, I mean, maybe the result is not creative, but <laughs> not in the way we think of creative, but but the process is, is, um, is always deeply creative, I think. Um, <clears throat> some people enjoy that creative process and some don't, and that shows also in the result. Um, and I don't think that there is a single, I don't, I don't experience a single uh, form of process. Um, and, and every time I've written a new book, the process seems to, to change. And that's why it takes me so lo long sometimes to, uh, like I've been writing a novel for four years and only last month was I able to understand like what the architecture is. Um, it was until last month, like an accumulation of notes that were dated like July 19th, 2019 until a month ago, just like that. And then one day, like uh, there's a, a, a kind of a, a notion of architecture, but um, each I think that each project for me has demanded a, a process that's unique to it, you know, and so I it takes me it takes me some time to get there because the project needs to have to be mature enough to start showing me the way in terms of how to really do it, if it requires interviewing or archival research or just introspection or or whatever it is. And as I, as I was saying at the beginning of this talk, I, I, um, that creative writing workshop in, this, in the detention center in New York um, was something I did in 2019. I'd never sat down in these years to, to try to write about it, partly because I knew that I was going to go back to a dark, dark, difficult place, <laughs> and I didn't want to. Um, I just really didn't want to. And then also because there were a lot of res restrictions about what we were allowed to say, not allowed to say, and I wasn't comfortable with saying then anything. The only way we circulated work, uh, that's also a story I don't tell in, the, in this, this version of the essay, but because we weren't allowed to publish any of, or like make public any of the work that the girls produced, the, of the writing that they produced, uh, we thought, well, but if we don't have... Um, physical evidence that there is, so we don't publish, if we don't publish it in a physical space, then who's going to say anything to us? So one thing we did then was to um, memorize lines or some, I don't remember if my niece might have taken a few pictures, but we gave those lines to a singer-songwriter um, that we worked with. Um, she's from California and we were putting together a performance with a a very dear friend of mine, a poet, Natalie Diaz, and we were going to do a performance in, in Nevada. And so the work that the girls had done circulated th in the form of music in that performance. But then, of course, that those songs we took back to the detention center, and then they heard them. Uh, so it was a really nice way to circulate something that didn't involve a material evidence of anything, so we were, we were fine. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, and I, 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 yeah, who knows, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I was really, I'm really kind of fascinated by the intense ambivalence um, within the detention center and within the state too, right? Of thinking it would be nice to bring creative writing, right, to these young people, but then being so intensely paranoid about what it means to unleash that, to give voice to the, to allow these children to have a kind of voice in writing right, um, so that you're not allowed to take anything out, you're not allowed to build the archive mm. of, of in public of what it is they're writing about and saying and thinking and what their what they're sometimes are. Mm. And I, I often think of that in fiction as the, the sort of space of the suppositional, right, suppose this, and it has a, a, um, mm -hmm. a flexible temporality, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was wondering if you could reflect more on your own practice and the, the, the space that writing occupies, right? Because on the one hand, there's this, you know, utopian notion, not even utopian, that's a bad word to use, right? But there's this notion that, that you know, the aesthetic and writing is, is something that we need to um, encourage in young people, the writing, the thinking, the creativity, and then the fear, right, in terms of control on what can be unleashed when we give children pen and paper and a voice. So I'm wondering if you could talk about how you, I, the role you see yourself playing in relationship to all that. No, I mean, I think that, it, that, that writing in the long run for a generation of the, the diaspora is, is uh, the only thing that might bring some kind of historical clarity uh, later. And I do think that there will be many people in that generation that will end up being stand-up comedians and, I don't know, write, write, I don't know, Netflix series or poems or experimental, whatever. There will be. I mean, it's a big generation. Um, there will be people that will talk about it, as, as has been the case historically with, with waves of uh, uh, exodus and diasporas. Uh, what is, I think, tricky and uh, is uh, it's just very, very troubling is that the idea that anything that that someone may write in while in detention, when their trial is pending, may constitute a, f a form of um, evidence against them, even if it were fiction. That 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 always troubled me enormously. Right. So how? I mean, the only way we found around that was uh, pen names and collective writing, and I think it was a it was a we we solved to a degree that problem. Right. Uh, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's best case scenario, a short hiatus in their lives. One that shouldn't have existed at all, that they should not have ever experienced. But in best case scenario, it, 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 it is a passage through something. You know? Like writing will continue, it, it, it was before and after especially. Uh, hi. Um, is it possible to situate your project within um, like a history of carceral literature? I'm assuming the concept exists. There is enormous, an enormous history, yeah, of carceral literature. Uh, but, um, but what do you mean? Well, I, mean, I was thinking like, you know, a Gulang archipelago or, um, or the way Havel has to sort of invent a, a different way of writing because, mm -hmm. you know, he can't sort of come out and... and criticize communism. Yeah, yeah. You made me think of this wonderful story that's not very well known uh, about um, a prison in Somalia where um, prison, a prisoner um, had with him uh, Anna, Karina, Anna Karina and were, was in, in a solitary cell next to another prisoner in a solitary cell. And they, together, over time, long stretches of time, developed first a, a la like a, a language a communication through through knocks on their wall, but eventually, because they had created an alphabet or had tra translated the alphabet to knocks, uh, then they were able one was able to read to the other, and uh, and read Anna Karenina once and again and again and again, and the. 
the one that was read to got out eventually and and told the story and and said that that really was uh, what saved him not only psychically in the time there but what was a what gave him moral instruments to to leave and 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 reconst reconstitute himself once once he had left no? I mean there's there's a so many wonderful prison stories or related to to literature and the role that literature has played or or writing that takes place in in, in prisons right I'm trying to think of um, there's also Daniel Carms the the Russian writer that writes these very very short pieces called incidences if you haven't read him I really really uh, recommend him um, he was he he was not allowed. He was banned from writing for for adults for a while and then imprisoned. And he was only allowed to write for children. Great strange punishment, right? And then uh, eventually he was not allowed to write at all. Yeah. Another hard question, <laughs> these young people. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I do think that maybe like um, uh, a lot of us need to go back constantly to, to childhood to, to, to re-articulate, you know, to understand. Um, and I think, you know, the, the gaze of a child is uh, a very foreign gaze uh, in the best possible sense. Um, not 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 foreign as in tourist of a place, but but foreign as in as in far away enough uh, that it has a kind of curiosity uh, that it doesn't assume too much. Um, close enough, um, perhaps driven by that same curiosity. So that f foreignness of the gaze in in childhood is what has always really interested me as as the sp the the distance from which to to write. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>